Welcome to EPG Parshala's linguistics course. I am Prabal Dasgupta of the Indian Statistical Institute. I'm responsible for the morphology and syntax paper of this course. In this, the 29th module on the grammar of compound verbs, we look at the syntax of certain verb verb combinations in Indian languages and place them in the context of the ideas we have been developing about phraseology and the relation between phraseology and syntax on the one hand and lexicon on the other. It is true that phraseology as such and the set of proverbs associated with the language lie slightly outside the responsibility of the grammar. The grammar of English cannot really take responsibility for the fact that one can see monkey see, monkey do at the level of aphorisms or proverbs. However, there are certain phraseological phenomena that appear all over the body of ordinary sentences, including embedded clauses. And the grammar does take some responsibility, as we're going to see in this module and the following module. The best known of these phenomena that the grammar takes responsibility for are idioms. They are normally defined as non-compositional expressions where the meanings of the parts do not add up to the meaning of the whole, so they are said not to be able to be composed into the meaning of the whole. When kick the bucket means die, the point is that the meaning of kick and the meaning of the and the meaning of bucket don't add up to form the meaning die. That is why we call it non-compositional. That is why we call it an idiom. Not all phraseological expressions, however, are idioms in this sense. Consider collocations. One says a quarter to three. One says half past four. You don't say one quarter before three. You don't say half an hour after four. Even though you could, there's nothing to stop you in the laws of English, but you don't. You say half past four, you say a quarter to three. These are collocations where all the words are ordinary words, but there are some collocations where unique words occur that never occur outside those collocations. Those are called bound words, or in a slightly fancy terminology, cranberry words, because the morpheme cran in the word cranberry used to be said to be a cranberry morpheme. One has extended that to words. So when you say hail and hearty, the word hail occurs there, which is not used in con contemporary English outside the expression hail and hearty. Or consider betwixt and between. Contemporary English no longer uses the preposition betwixt, except in the collocation betwixt and between. If you want a cover term that covers both idioms that are non-compositional and collocations that are compositional, we simply say phraseological expression. Now there are some phraseological expressions in Indian languages that occupy a lot of space in the grammar and they need our attention. They're called compound verbs. In order to appreciate the phraseological character of compound verbs, it is useful to contrast them to a construction that is completely compositional. I'm talking about a construction that uses either modal verbs in the sense developed earlier in the context of English models, or uses lexical synonyms of modal verbs, which are often control verbs. If you look at how modals and these lexical equivalents to modals 
set up the structure around them and enter into relations with the verbal complex that they either take part in if they're models or that they are separated from by only one clause boundary if they are control predicates. You will find that the relationships are entirely compositional. These are the constructions with which compound verbs can be most directly compared. Let us begin by comparing Hindi-Urdu models with English models and run a quick check to see if what we think we understand about English models can just be bodily transferred to the analysis of Hindi-Urdu. Then we get an analysis of Hindi-Urdu models for free, don't we? We're going to find that that isn't possible. Consider Ram Wapas Ja Sakta Hai, example one, and compare it with its English gloss, Ram can go back, which has a modal can. I was also talking about equivalence of models that are lexical. Can has a lexical equivalent, be able to. Ram is able to go back. There are other pairs of this kind. In German, there is a modal will, which isn't quite like English will. A German will means wants. And nearly synonymous to will in German is the control trigger lexical verb wünschen, to wish. How do you distinguish models from these lexical equivalents which are control triggers? In the case of English and German, it is fairly easy to make the distinction. Models take bare infinitivals. In fact, naked infinitivals, the ones without two. So you get John can swim. Likewise, in German, you get Johann will here bleiben. In contrast, be able to in English and wünschen in German take full-blooded infinitivals with the infinitival marker two in English and zu in German. Thus, John can swim contrasts with John is able to swim. Swim is a naked infinitival, to swim is a full infinitival. In German, you contrast Johann will here bleiben, literally John wants here stay, which means John wants to stay here. Here, the modal will takes bleiben, which is a naked infinitival. This contrasts with what happens if you choose the control trigger wünschen, wish? The sentence becomes Johann wünscht hier zu bleiben. Literally, John wishes here to stay, meaning John wishes to stay here. At first sight, this seems to be suitable for Hindi Urdu. In Hindi Urdu, you have a contrast between Ram Wapas Ja Sakta Hai, where the modal Ja chooses the naked infinitival, I'm sorry, the modal Sakta chooses the naked infinitival Ja on the one hand. And on the other hand, a lexical control trigger that you get exemplified in Ram Wapas Jani Ko Tayar Hai. Ram is ready to go back, where Tayar, ready is a lexical trigger that selects a full-blooded infinitival ja ne ko to go where the hindi ko corresponds to german su and english too you feel entirely ready to take the analysis from english and german and just lift it and place it in hindi urdu does that work the reason that this doesn't work is that to start with Hindi Urdu naked stems of verbs do a lot of different things. You cannot conclude when you see a naked stem that it's infinitival in character. Consider sentence three Ram Wapas Ja Chuka hai, where the very different auxiliary chuka 
selects the naked stem ja. It is impossible to believe that ja in ja chuka hai is an infinitive. It is clearly waiting to join with the perfect aspect auxiliary and there is something aspectual already about the stem, even though it is naked. Likewise, when you look at what is going to be the staple food of this module, compound verbs like de de ga will give, thak gaya became tired, which are exemplified in four and five, you begin to see that there are these naked stems that carry conjunctive participle features, which is the Hindi technical term corresponding to a perfect participle in English. This isn't just a fact about Hindi, Urdu. In English, you can demonstrate that there are sentences in which a naked verbal stem carries perfect aspect features. Consider examples of VP fronting. When the, the verbal form carries a progressive ending, you get we thought they were going home, and indeed going home they were. Going home doesn't change. Likewise, the infinitival in go home doesn't change, and we thought they would go home, and indeed go home they did. But the perfect ending in gone, we thought they had gone home, disappears, leaving a naked stem carrying perfect features. In the full sentence, we thought they had gone home, and indeed, go home they had. Nobody says gone home they had. You see, therefore, that both in Hindi, Urdu, and in English, it is possible for a naked verb stem to be perfect or perfective rather than infinitive. Fortunately for us, the syntacticians who study English and German don't depend just on these extremely delicate and fragile devices within the inflectional morphology to distinguish models from the nearly synonymous lexical control triggers that we are comparing them with. If you compare 9 with 10 in English, you will find that the modal auxiliary can is compatible with the expletive element there, but that the control trigger be able is not. Thus, you can say there can be serious trouble at the demonstration. You can't say there is able to be serious trouble at the demonstration. Just as the syntax of English gives you criteria like these to distinguish models from control triggers, you are able to do something like that for Hindi, Urdu as well, if you look at syntactic diagnostics rather than morphological ones. If you compare the modal verb sakta with lexical triggers like chahna, to want, or tayar hona, to be ready or willing, you see that lexical triggers permit negation of the main clause and negation of the infinitival. I shall call that double negation for short. In contrast, the modal sakta, can, does not permit double negation. Thus, you can say Ram is not ready not to go back, which comes out in Hindi Urdu as Ram wapas na jane ko tayar nahi hai. You can also say Ram does not want not to go back, which in Hindi Urdu is Ram wapas na jana nahi chahta. These are examples 11a and b. These contrast very sharply with Ram wapas nahi ja nahi sakta, which is an attempt to say Ram cannot not go back. Here there is the surprising fact that in Hindi Urdu you cannot say Ram wapas nahi ja nahi sakta, but in English, surprisingly, you can say Ram can't not go back, Ram cannot not go back. To handle this surprising fact, 
it becomes important for us to distinguish between syntax and pragmatics. That is a side issue. We are not discussing English models in this module. We are just drawing your attention to this so that you don't lose track of what is happening. Now we come to the main point of this module, which is the study of these compound verbs in Indian languages. A compound verb brings together a main verb called a pole with a semi-auxiliary called a vector. It is a semi-auxiliary and a semi-lexical element because it isn't weak enough to be an auxiliary and it isn't strong enough to be a full lexical element. You've already seen some examples. Thak kaya hai has become tired is a compound of the pole thak with the vector gaya. De de ga will give is a compound of the pole de with the vector de ga. There is nothing quite like a compound verb in English, French, German, Polish, etc. You can make a comparison between the semantics of Indian compound verbs and that of the English or German verb particle construction. You can compare sit down in English with bet jana in Hindi, Urdu, even though the constituents of bet jana are bet, sit, and jana, go. So the second constituent is not a particle but another verb. You can compare English throw away with the particle away with the Hindi Urdu double verb construction pek dena, where pek na means throw and dena means give. So throw give corresponds to throw away, sit go corresponds to sit down. This is a semantic question whether English verb particle constructions really carry meanings that can be accurately described as being identical to the verb verb constructions in, in the Urdu. That, however, is not a question before us because we are handling syntax. What kind of syntactic structure should be postulated for a compound verb? The neatest logical option to say is to say that the vector is a matrix verb it selects a complement clause. Unfortunately, in Hindi, Urdu, the pole carries no morphological marking on the stem and doesn't give us information about the kind of complement clause that these poles, I'm sorry, these vectors are selecting. There are other Indian languages, such as Marathi and Bangla, where the status of the pole is marked overtly, the pole in these languages shares its ending with the conjunctive participle. This begins to help us to figure out an analysis. Consider examples like 14, sham chobita amade peruddiye debe, which means sham will give the picture back to us. The detailed glosses are sham, the picture, us, back, give, will. There are several other examples under 4 which have the same general structure, under 14 which have the same general structure. In 15 you have counterparts where the same conjunctive participle morphology appears on what corresponds to the pole verb, but in this case the second verb in the construction is not a vector and is not in a compound formation with the pole. Instead, it is another independent verb. Consider 15a, which corresponds in this set of examples to our 14a that was just cited. 15a is Sham will give us the picture and go home. This is Chobita Amadidiya Sham Bari Pirbe, literal gloss, picture us having given Sham home will return. If you compare 15a, Sham will give us the picture and go home, with 14a, Sham will give us the picture back. You can see that 15a really has two clauses in it. Marathi has similar data 
we save space and time by not providing it. The data suggest that in all these languages, including Hindi, Urdu, the pole is a conjunctive participle. If that is the case, we have a question that needs to be confronted before we finalize our default decision to say that the vector is a matrix verb selecting a complement clause and the pole heads the complement clause. The difficulty is we have just determined that the pole carries conjunctive participle morphology. We need to have some clarification before we can agree to turn a participle structure into a complement. You see in everything we have discussed so far in syntax, throughout this course and in many other contexts. To answer the question, how can a structure headed by a verb carrying participle morphology count as a complement? You need to kind of step back and take a look at the markings of other known adjunct or modifier structures and other known complement structures and see whether there is enough specialization to, to justify this consternation about the use of participial morphology in a complement structure. Consider the sentence, I will stay if you stay. If marks an adjunct here, a conditional adjunct. Compare it with, we wonder if you will stay if in this sentence marks an interrogative complement. Turning from if to whether, the whether clause whether you stay or not is an adjunct in I will stay whether you stay or not. But when you look at the example we wonder whether you will stay, the whether clause is a complement. That was if and whether. Let's come to two. There is a two clause in we gave them water to quench their thirst. Here the two clause is a purposive adjunct. However, when you say they allowed you to leave peacefully, to leave peacefully is a compliment. Let's do this across languages. The Bangla verbal ending te marks an adjunct in a sentence like to disturb people, Dilip repeatedly goes missing. The same te marking marks a complement structure. In the example, Dilip lokke jalate bhalobashe, Dilip loves disturbing people. Let us try another language, Hindi Urdu. A clause marked with the marking ne se is an adjunct in the sentence Sham ke ghar wapas ane se Ram ko koi fayda nahi hoga which means Ram will gain nothing from Sham's coming home. But the same ne se marking marks a complement clause in the example Madhu ne is karyakram mein shamil hone se inkar kar diya which means Madhu refused to take part in this program. With so many examples of a marking shared between adjunct constructions and complement constructions, surely we can conclude that there is nothing sacred about a marking that tells you that once it has been used to mark a participial, it is frozen into adjunct status and cannot be used in a complement. So there is nothing to stop us from allowing vectors to take complements whose marking happens to look like an adjunct marking. The geometrical difference in the tree structure is that when you have a vector, the vector is a V that takes an S complement and the pole heads that S complement. Whereas when the conjunctive participle is a real adjunct participle, its structure is an S, then that material is adjoined either to the matrix S, as in the example we considered earlier, where Sham shows a picture and then goes home, or it is an adjunct to the matrix VP, as in example 15 double A. Sham amade chobita diye bari 
which comes out as Sham will give us the picture and go home. Here it's adjoined to the VP and not to the S. We might take a moment to explain what we mean by saying adjoined to VP or adjoined to S. In 15 AA, Chobita Amadirdi, having given us the picture, is adjoined to Bari Pirbe. We'll go back home. In other words, the VP Bari Pirbe will go back home is doubled. So you have the VP here with Bari Pirbe under it, and then there is a second copy of that VP up there. The lower copy is called VP2, the upper copy is called VP1. That upper copy takes an extra daughter, which is this conjunctive participle marked adjunct business. That extra daughter, by being adjoined to the VP, forces the VP into a double node. There is a mother node hosting the new visitor and a daughter node hosting the original content of the VP. That is how adjunct status is shown by adjoining the material in the geometric sense to some part of the tree. That was about the geometry of the tree. Now we need to talk about the legitimacy of the term compound verb. One would imagine that a compound is a word. Surely a compound verb is two words. In fact, we're admitting that, the, that there's a sentence boundary between them. How can that be a compound, you will ask. We are claiming it's a syntactic compound. In order to assess this claim, you might want to go back to the modules of morphology and review what we discussed about morphological compounds in those modules. Feel free to do that. We can't really do this exercise for you because there's no efficient way to take a stretch of talking that we did in connection with the morphology modules and pull it into the syntax talking. We will leave that to you and to the traffic between you and your e-text. To understand what is meant by a syntactic compound, we take you back to German, a language that seems to be becoming one of our major languages of exemplification in this course. There is a German compound verb, zu machen, which means shut. A verb that is used with a word for door, so you say die Tür zu machen, to shut the door. The verb can be used as a single word in a sentence like 16. Wir können die Tür zu machen. We can the door shut. That is to say, we can shut the door. It contrasts with a sentence where zu and machen are separated. Peter macht sehr bald die Tür zu, sentence 17. Literally, Peter makes very soon the door to. To making is the German word for shut. That amounts to Peter will shut the door very soon. But the word shut sort of has sh in one place and at in the other. That's how the word is distributed over two parts of the sentence and merits the term syntactic compound. To call it a syntactic compound is to claim that the zu part of it and the machen part of it are not working separately to express any meaning. There is no separate meaning contract between the sound content of zu and the meaning content of zu. No separate meaning contract between the sound content of machen and the meaning contract of machen. The meaning content of machen. The sound content of machen and the meaning content of machen are not acting on their own in any bond. You have to think of the discontinuous zu dot 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 machen on the level of sound as being face to face with a single meaning at the semantic level. This is what we mean by claiming that zu dot 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 machen is a syntactic compound. It is one word sitting in two places, a word that is spread out. This has been worked out in the grammar of German. We are appealing to the grammar of German repeatedly because it is one of the best studied languages on the planet. There are exhaustive and very carefully and rigorously written studies of German grammar by some of the best minds in the field over several centuries. 
you might then argue that we're working on the wrong track and that instead of calling such things compounds, we should call them collocations. You will have noticed that we introduced the term collocation and you might say, why not use these tools? Why not put this in the phraseology rather than the lexicon? It is messy to call them compounds if they're spread all over the sentence. Call them collocations. Collocations are idiosyncratic and cannot be systematized. If you take Hale and Hearty, or few and far between, or betwixt and between, these are collocations, you will be hard put to find elements that add up to a grammatical system. From the existence of betwixt and between, and few and far between, and Hale and Hearty, can you draw any inferences? Can you conclude that there will therefore be collocations looking like x, y, and z? Does anything follow from the existence of betwixt and between as a collocation, of few and far between as a collocation, of Hill and Hearty as a collocation? Nothing follows from it. These are idiosyncratic facts. They don't add up. They don't bunch together in any natural way. Compounds are not like that. Particle verb compounds in German and verb particle constructions in English show exactly the same patterns, even though in English the word boundary gives you the impression that verb particle constructions are phrases rather than compound words. Particular particles are associated with characteristic meanings. That is what I mean by saying that they are systematic in a way that collocations cannot be. When I say that they're systematic, however, I don't imply that they're completely systematic because if they're completely systematic, one would have to say that these vectors have become auxiliaries. Can in English is fully grammaticalized. It always expresses a possible action reading, as does German kann, as does Hindi Urdu sakta hai. You cannot make this kind of statement for any vector. So what we're saying is that vectors in Indian languages and particles in English or German are halfway between the grammar and the lexicon. They're a semi-systematic set. They're not a completely systematic set of resources that you get in tense aspect or modality. And they're not totally unsystematic as in the case of phraseology, as in the case of phraseology proper. I suppose at some level you could call compound verbs examples of phraseology, but add that they're semi-systematic. When we claim that some pair of pieces of a sentence should be regarded as really one word, as a syntactic compound, at the very least we are claiming that an operation like negation can hit it only once. In other words, a compound verb will not accept double negation. Whereas the material we were studying earlier where there is a control predicate like be able to or like wish in the main clause and it takes a complement clause completely compositionally, those things can take double negation. We are now going to look at double negation with some care. In order to look at double negation with some care and to look at the distributional properties of the constructions in the compound verb case and in these compositional cases we wish to compare them with, we are going to use a new diagnostic criterion, namely the possibility of having cranberry words or bound words on one side or the other of these boundaries involved, either the boundary between the pole and the vector or the boundary between a lexical trigger and the infinitival into which it controls. Since a control trigger plus an infinitival clause 
is a compositional construction. It turns out that you neither have cranberry control triggers nor cranberry verbs downstairs that are connected to them by this compositional device. But the collocational bond is so strong between the pole and the vector that in the case of compound verbs, we often find cranberry words in the position of the pole. And in some cases, we even find a cranberry vector or two. This is a very important contrast between constructions like want to verb in the world's languages, where you don't find cranberries on either side of the boundary, and compound verbs in Indian languages, where you find lots of cranberry verbs. Thus, in Bangla, to be sick and tired of comes out as hidiya jawa, where jawa, the vector, is the regular verb to be, but hidiya, the pole expressing being sick and tired, is a cranberry word. It never occurs except in the context of the compound verb hidiya jawa. Kece jawa, which means to fizzle out and is applied to plans, a plan fizzling out, again has the vector go collocating with a cranberry word keche. Dhe asha to come running has the vector asha to come collocating with the cranberry pole dhe. Tere asha to come running aggressively has the same vector come collocating with yet another cranberry word tere, etc., etc. We cannot cite absences, but there are no cranberry words in the tribe of control verbs and among the verbs downstairs that collocate with control verbs. There are no strong collocation bonds that are frozen into cranberry status for one partner or the other in these compositional partnerships. Now, there's a surprising fact to encounter. The surprising fact is that these compositional structures are normally expected to permit double negation. It makes sense that the upstairs control predicate should be able to take a negation and that the downstairs predicate that it controls into should be able to take an independent negation. Thus, you can say of an alcoholic, John is not able to not drink. That's a perfectly valid structure, and there's no difficulty applying double negation. Correspondingly, in Bangla, you can say, Dilip monir ke chobita perot nadi te chai bena. Dilip won't want to not give the picture back to Munir. That structure is fine with double negation. The control predicate chawa to want upstairs and the verb peruddewa to give back downstairs. Negation at both places. However, there is a surprising departure from this pattern when the control verb is to be able to, para in Bangla. At sentences 19 and 20, you find 19 shows that double negation with the infinitival downstairs and this control verb para upstairs is ungrammatical. If you try to say 19, Dilip Munirke Chobita Perut Nadi Teparbena, in order to express the meaning, Dilip won't be able to not give this picture back to Munir. You fail, the sentence crashes. 19 is ungrammatical, sharply ungrammatical. Instead of 19, you're required to say 20. Dilip Munir ke chobita perut na diye parbena. Instead of saying not to give with the infinitival dite to give, 20 requires you to say not having given 
negation followed by the conjunctive participle form DA of the verb, where everything leads you to expect the infinitival, including the semantics. This is a surprising fact that we need to understand more closely. The first fact is that pattern 20 requires the conjunctive DA instead of the expected infinitival DITE. And we don't have any general pattern that this expands into. Although every verb is possible here, it's a pattern. It's not a fact about one lexical item. The second mysterious aspect of this pattern is that it is limited to finite clauses. The moment you go into non-finite forms for the upstairs control predicate, as in 21A and 21B, double negation becomes perfect and the infinitival downstairs becomes the only option. There is no question of replacing it with the conjunctive participle. It is time to conclude what we have been able to do in this module. We were looking at certain concentrated and widespread phraseology-like phenomena in Indian languages specifically the compound verb construction. We have found that compound verb constructions harbor phenomena which are opaque and idiosyncratic to some extent, especially cranberry words, and that they contrast in this respect with compositional constructions such as those where modals or modal equivalent lexical triggers select infinitival complements and permit double negation, one upstairs and one downstairs, in the case of lexical triggers. What is special about those compositional constructions, both the lexical trigger cases and the modal cases, is that there is never a cranberry word on either side of the predicate boundary. In contrast, compound verbs have lots of cranberry words. We use cranberry verbs, cranberry words as a diagnostic for the contrast between the compositional constructions and the relatively opaque compound verb constructions. One of the points we made in this module was that the vector in a compound verb selects a pole-headed complement which has the same morphology as conjunctive participles but which does not for that reason have to be regarded as an adjunct. We pointed out that throughout linguistic systems adjuncts and complements very often share the same morphological marking. We urge you to study with care the detailed versions of these points made in our e-text and to explore the further readings that we have recommended. We also invite you to give us any feedback that you might wish to. Thank you for your attention.